Hi, welcome to Bob Plays Video Games. My name is Alonso, and I'm going to be performing for you today. In this video, we're going to compare video games to theater, specifically the relationship between spectator and actor, and that to player. In the first section, I'm just going to talk about a game that I really liked, and try to analyze that through the lens that uh, we're going to be getting more deep in in the following sections, where we're going to kind of see different takes on the relationship between spectator and actor and player. Like my previous videos, and probably most future ones, hopefully, um, I'm not really trying to arrive at any truths or trying to do an objective analysis. I'm more trying to um, approach video game criticism or uh, designing or reading or playing, etc., through what hopefully will be an interesting lens. And hopefully people can do cool stuff with that. In this video, we're going to mostly be talking about games with a more traditional-ish narrative, just because it's a smaller scope than, say, trying to um, talk about the spectator slash uh, performance aspects of Tetris or Football Manager. Not that you can't extract the story from Football Manager or even, like, uh, Football League or even Tetris, but we'll discuss that another time. For now, let's keep it to a three-act, a resolution, conflict, hero's journey, blah, blah, blah. So games have actually gotten really good at telling those types of stories whilst using interesting mechanics, innovative ideas, um, you know, enthralling plots and whatnot. The thing about certain games, uh, the certain games I'm going to talk about to make my point, certain games uh, with the story-rich tag in your uh, digital storefront of choice, games like Beginner's Guide, Gone Home, Her Story, Dear Esther, Return to the Oberdin, uh, Tacoma. All games, by the way, I highly recommend and you should definitely find a way to play. All these games share an approach to the main story that puts uh, the Avatar as kind of audience, as in the main, the game itself is kind of a stage where your playable character is a spectator to the main conflict. Also, a lot of these games will normally use the main mechanic for you to find out what happened there before. You basically don't have any agency. It's like all the interesting thing happened to other people. And that's fine. Again, they're great games. But it stands in a stark contrast to games where you have a more performative role. Games like Stanley Parable, That Dragon Cancer, A Night in the Woods, Thomas Was Alone, um, Life is Strange, The Walking Dead. And yeah, even with games like Stanley Parable and The Walking Dead, even though it has all these branchy thingies, it's basically still one story. Like, your character only has or only lives one story. It's it's like a choose-your-own-adventure book, um, which I don't think is very controversial to say, and it's definitely not a, a, a blight on these games. But it's, it's like retroactively only one narration happens. Now, in case you haven't been fortunate enough to play any of the games I've mentioned, I'm going to explain both types of them and what I mean and what I'm trying to say by analyzing uh, what remains of Edith Finch. So in this game, you belong to this big family that has this curse to uh, die all the time and prematurely and weirdly and tragic circumstances. Um, but obviously, always giving enough, I think, at least one person can, you know, continue making generations and whatnot. And your great-grandmother has been alive almost the longest, so it's, you know, kind of like a hundred years of solitude. But um, I'm not going to analyze themes. Uh, plenty of people have done that already. So basically, you go back to your childhood home, which you swore never to go back to or haven't been there in a while, and you explore the house, and you explore each of the family members' rooms, because they all have their own, and um, you find out a little bit more about them. And in each room, there will be a um, main object that when you interact with it, a mini game will open up, and they're mostly tasteful, very classy, in which you basically become that family member, your avatar becomes a family member, and you find out how they died. So basically, you're playing out their diaries or letters or whatever. Um, it's, it's a really good game. I highly recommend it. Give it a go. Uh, basically, the whole house is a stage and each room is like a mini play. I think there's a there's a theater company called Punch Drunk, which is literally doing this somewhere around the world. So in What Remains of Edith Finch, 
you're basically constantly switching between a performer role and a spectator role. Um, there's this one death scene in which, um, well, spoiler alert and uh, infanticide warning, because uh, you're basically playing a baby that that dies. When I was playing it, it felt a little bit shock value, but I, I don't think it actually is. Here's the thing. So this happens more or less halfway through the game. So by this point, you already have the main loop internalized. That being, um, find your way into the next room, explore for a bit, find the main object, play the mini game, um, see the last moments of that given family member's life and their death, uh, think about the human condition and mortality and whatnot, go to the next room. So you're in the room. You find the main object, which in this case is a note attached to some divorce papers, I think. And then you uh, click on it, and then the screen does its thing. It goes woo 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 or whatever. And um, and then your avatar is a baby in a bathtub. And then you're like, oh my god, this baby's gonna die. And I found this game through some of the research that I did that mentioned it briefly. So when I was playing it, I kind of had my you know analysis hat on. But it was, I think because it was a baby, it was definitely the most... Basically, I just realized, like, oh my god, I gotta perform this baby's death. I mean, it's the same for the rest of the characters, but it's basically a script I gotta follow. I, there's this horrible thing that's going to happen, and I know what's gonna happen, but I have to do it. And look, there is things that you are spectating, like, you know, like finding out the new game mechanics or whatever, the world, the each character's imagination, uh, the spectacle and all that stuff. You're not literally, you know, performing the story as an actor would a script, but you have no agency to, let's say, change the narrative or change the script. And the thing is, it isn't a clear cut line between performance and uh, spectating in these types of games. But there are some playwrights out there who weren't that happy between clear-cut lines uh, in the relationship between performers and spectators. So let's get a bit deeper. Let's compare uh, video games to specific branches and movements in theater. So in this section, I'm mostly going to be summarizing Chapter 3 from the late Catherine Whitlock's uh, doctoral thesis, and where she uses um, specific games from specific genres. I want to generalize it a little bit. Um, also keep in mind that this was written in 2004, so certain games like um, Dwarf Fortress or Stanley Parable or Undertale and stuff like that hadn't really happened yet. The Sims did though, so I guess that was revolutionary enough. But um, also the examples that she gives for games. Well, let's get to it. So, so Whitlock is going to start by comparing um, Aristotelian theater to Lara Croft. And I'm just going to generalize this into comparing um, games with a normalish story to theater with a normalish story. And yeah, it's a bit of a tautology, but it's basically the three-act structure thing. And uh, Whitlock kind of makes a point to say that it makes more sense to compare it to theater than to film. Basically because, you know, well, film did get a lot of its cues from theater, but also because of the interactive and performative aspects of each. Another thing that Whitlock points out is what she calls the immediacy of action. That is the fact that things kind of happen real time. And you only see the, I guess, the beats that affect the singular character on her journey to achieve her singular goal. Additionally, uh, these narrative beats have to happen in a certain order. Um, even in unisequential or multi-sequential games, um, you still have to adhere to the rules of... What is it? A conflict, climax, resolution. And it's no coincidence that the games with these Aristotelian tendencies uh, take control away from the player in the form of cutscenes in order to make sure that the narrative beats and needs are kept and flow with an organic manner. 
Because, I mean, at the end of the day, pacing is a language we've kind of grown accustomed to, or at least the specific type of pacing of, you know, the three F structure stuff. Look, it's not controversial to say that normalish stories and games are akin to normalish stories and theater. So let's talk about the not normal stuff. Um, there's this playwright called Brecht who kind of wanted to always make the audience aware that they were watching a theater play by creating a distance in between the spectator and the actors. Brecht created this distance so that the audience wouldn't be immersed in the play and would actually have the brain room necessary to uh, critically think about the ideas being presented in the play. And they were very dialectic or didactic uh, Marxist ideas. He created this distance by, among other things, not hiding the theater magic. So basically, uh, you would see all the light arrays. Um, there would be no curtains to hide the scene changes. Uh, there would be no backdrop as such. Instead, there would be like a huge placards or labels. Basically, um, saying the name of each scene, or even actually telling you what was going to happen in each scene. Some of that stuff is normal now, but it wasn't then, so you would lose all sense of immersion. Um, Woodlock is going to compare three aspects of Brecht's epic theater to uh, RPGs, specifically Final Fantasy VII. Okay, one. Um, Brecht's theater is very modular or cyclical, uh, in the same way that in Final Fantasy VII, you kind of have, besides the main story and the main plot and blah, 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 you have, you know, all these little stories and all these little things, each with their own conflict and resolution, and you can kind of choose in which uh, order to play them in. Sometimes, like, there is a big arcing thing, but mostly, uh, kind of, I guess. It's a bit of a tenuous link, even though it does get a bit deeper in the paper, but, um... I can't really go super in-depth into each of the things, so let's move on. Secondly, Brecht really goes out of his way to separate the stage from the action happening on it. Um, and, you know, pointing out the different stories that these can tell. And Whitlock is going to compare this to the different stories that are told by either the characters or the world in Final Fantasy VII. I also want to point out um, a good example of this is, for example, like how you change, you know, between like when you're in the battle bits or like the world exploring or the cutscenes and stuff. Lastly, uh, Breck's Epic Theater would always have like a call to action. So you weren't just there to, you know, please your senses. You actually wanted to do something revolutionary with it. Um, the play itself should transcend the theatrical space. Uh, Whitlock is going to equivocate this to the fact that in RPGs, um, you have to have kind of a strategic mind on in opposition to just the reactive needs of stuff like Tomb Raider. I want to underline the thing that's at the background of all these three points that is kind of the distancing that occurs. Um, and you could say, well, I'm going to make you say it, uh, so I can respond to it. You could say that um, you can't really, I guess, you know, hide the curtains in a game because uh, it's the code. So unless you speak assembly, you can't really show the guts. But you do have stuff like the Psycho Mantis boss from Metal Gear Solid, um, where in order to beat it, you have to literally unplug your controller from the console and plug it into the other socket. Now, uh, George Weedman from Super Bunny Hop has a great video on this, but to paraphrase him, he's like, you know, with a completely straight face, the video game is like, here real world, here video game. A lot of stuff like ARGs and virtual reality and stuff, um, they're trying to virtualize the real world, whereas MSG is like, no, I, no, like, um, to hell with immersion, just chirp balls. Other games that show machinery, but not in such a amazing way, is stuff like Stanley Parable, Beginner's Guide, uh, Pony Island, that weird browser game with the frog, uh, September 12th, Hotline Miami. Um, yeah, you get the idea. Games that basically are mostly games about games, 
and mostly to be like, hey, you don't really have any agency in video games. Uh, yeah, you're just the performer. You're a performer of the script and simultaneously a spectator of their info dumps, narrative beats, agendas, lessons, etc. There's other aspects of games that show machinery as well. Stuff like uh, min-maxing, competitive game metas, uh, mods, you know, world builders. Uh, Whitlock talks about cheat codes and stuff like that. So yeah, there's definitely a design norm in AAA gaming to try to immerse the player as much as possible. And I am a big fan of games that are like, let's not do that. Instead, make it very clear that we are games to make you critically think about their ideas and stories and whatnot. The thing is that none of these games, except for I believe one, but I haven't finished it yet, um, use that distancing or that madness or the showing of mechanics or whatever to um, espouse Marxist ideals and stuff like that as Brecht did. Um, which is, you know, it's fine, I guess. Um, there is a studio called uh, Mol Industria that does a very similar thing, but we're going to talk about them um, two sections down. Cool. Let's get to the last playwright slash genre that Woodlock talks about, which is also kind of the mm, not best one, not most interesting one. It's just it's, it's, it's the one where you really start mixing up spectator and actor. So Augusto Ball created an interactive revolutionary theater, one in which the audience could uh, become an actor. So the spectators would become, as he puts it, spect actors. Uh, more specifically, the spectators would become actors and actors in the sense of one who acts, like, you know, doing stuff, revolutionary stuff. Scripts would be short and would deal with a common everyday realistic dilemma to which the audience would then present and play out different solutions. And then all the different solutions that all the different people presented would then be discussed um, and whatnot. I mean, the spect actor would literally role play. Um, Catherine Whitlock is going to compare this to Morbs, specifically to EverQuest, because again, this was written in 2004. Firstly, she's gonna compare these two through their social aspects, which I don't really need to explain. Secondly, she's going to make the comparison that in the same way that you have to create your character and, you know, the specifics of it in EverQuest, in uh, the Forum Theater, Boal would quite often encourage the spect actors to take different roles than what they were accustomed to in terms of, like, race, gender, and that kind of stuff. And finally, Woodlock points out a sort of... Uh, I guess a temporal fluidity to both, like the forum theater would be very informed by the world around it and, you know, because it was solving problems with the world around it. And I guess she's saying that in the same way EverQuest kind of deals with the social or communal aspects of that virtual world. And these comparisons that I oversimplify are actually pretty sound in the paper. The only thing is that EverQuest and no RPG that I can think of really promotes the political forum that Boal was seeking. And honestly, thinking about it, I'm sure there's a tabletop RPG that does exactly that, but I, I just don't know about it. So if you do know of one like that, you know, comments. Thanks. There is a developer that does all the stuff that the Epic Theater and Forum Theaters were trying to do, if not exactly, at least in a very parallel way, in terms of seeking what those theatrical movements were trying to achieve through performance, uh, specifically performer, spectators, and political action. The studio slash collective is Mole Industria, whose um, politically charged games work because you are a spect actor of sorts, and you do have that distancing as well. So in a lot of these games, your avatar is basically the bad guy. Like, you can be like a drone pilot or a financial identifier, basically, or like a factory owner or something like that. And then, you know, you're still playing a game. You still want to win, rack up the points, make those numbers go up. But you also want the good guys to win. So you have this 
dichotomy, which creates the space for you to critically think about your actions as that avatar, and also, you know, the impact of the things that they're talking about IRL. For example, for example, one of their games is called Nova Alea, in which you are basically the force of gentrification. So you're buying and selling, I guess, luxury apartments or something. It's all very abstract. And then um, the city starts fighting back by doing like rent capping and stuff like that. So as a player, I'm still going to try my hardest to make sure that I win and that the box that represents my money gets as big as possible. But on the other hand, every time I see somebody rent capping, like inside, I'm kind of like, yay. There's another one called Pedo Priest, which I don't think I need to explain or want to explain. There's oligarchy where you are an oil baron and you use your influence to just mess with the entire world. To build a bit of mousetrap has you overseeing a factory and, you know, controlling salaries, replacing workers with automation, um, putting them in jail if they start rioting outside and stuff. There's Unmanned, in which you are a drone pilot that falls in love. They're all really good games. They're all free. Uh, check them out. Links below, obviously. Um, and they don't all follow that very specific formula. There's also, I think one of the most famous ones is um, Every Day the Same, which is um, about office work and the monotony of it. All these games challenge both the traditional narrative and the hero fantasy of like most AAA games and stuff like that. Um, as they put it in their manifesto, uh, Mole Industria doesn't like games, and for this very reason, it creates them. In the same way that theoretical movements uh, messed with the theatrical memento or whatever of the time, um, Mole Industry games challenge your position as a performer, spectator, player to, you know, bring to light issues of our day. And they create a space to critique status quo's with um, game mechanics and info dumps. By the way, you can also mess with the variables of a performer and spectator to actually make sure your audience doesn't question anything and maintains status quo. Something like um, America's Army, which was developed by the army, the actual army, in which you are, it's like a multiplayer first person shooter. So you have your team and you're the good guys. Uh, the Freedom Fighters and the other team is the terrorist. The thing is that the other players see themselves as the army and you as the terrorist. Because, you know, we couldn't have any of our players empathizing even trivially with the bad guys. Um, yeah, that's a thing. What we're trying to get at here is that Traditionally, the spectator passively receives while the actor gives. And, you know, th this is the stuff that Boal and Brecht were trying to mess up, among many others. And in comparing video games to theater, we're going to ask how much can a player actually give? How can we critically think about a game's uh, messages, agendas, ideals? How much agency has that game in forcing the player to think about that stuff through didactic choices or puzzle solving. In the first chapter of The Emancipated Spectator, The Emancipated Spectator, Rancier poses a critique to spectator passivity. Uh, basically, theater is just a bunch of people watching suffering, passively, with no agency to act. There is a need to invigorate the community, and audience is a community, it's a bunch of people occupying time and space, and it's a community that can very easily, for better or worse, see itself as not the stage, not the characters, not the actors. Rancier also brings up Artaud, which did kind of the opposite of what Brecht did, like instead of, um, you know, teaching you Marx by creating that difference, it tried to kind of create this bombastic and horrifying spectacle in which you were so shocked, you kind of were forced to engage intellectually. Speaking about his theater of cruelty, Artaud calls for the spectator to abandon their position as such. Rather than being placed in front of a spectacle, they are surrounded by the performance, drawn into the circle of action that restores their collective energy. How is that not a video game? Rancier then compares the relationship between spectator and actor to that of um, pupil and schoolmaster. Um, 
a schoolmaster can only give knowledge if, and by definition, they have to be one step ahead of the student. A schoolmaster knows exactly what the student should and does not, whereas a pupil doesn't even know what they don't know. The counter to this is the ignorant schoolmaster, uh, not one who just continuously gives out random bits of information, but rather one who helps the pupil to make connections between what they do already know and what they don't know. The spectator just sees stuff while the spect actor has the ability to, well, actually act. However, Rancière is like, fuck that. Why you gotta be like that? Why can't the you spectate actively? Why not see the agency inherent in the audience? Maybe the spectator has a non-trivial interaction by default, an active role in uh, interpretation, emotional connections, deductions, uh, map making, etc. We're always spectating. We're always learning and teaching, receiving and giving, uh, acting and knowing, uh, playing and translating, all at the same time. I'm going to end the main body of the video by reading out Mole Industria's manifesto or a section of it appropriately called a uh, video gamer or video gamed. Let's look for a baby in this ocean of bathwater. Game are interactive media commanded an active fruition. The act of playing a video game mainly consists of the deciphering its gameplay, disassembling the system of rule, revealing the underlying mechanisms. If in order to beat a final boss, I have to hit it three times on the head, then much of the difficulty lies in discovering by trial and error what the programmer wants me to do. This is the opposite of what happens in advertising. Commercials seem to be more effective when they are not transparent, or in films, which may fail by revealing their inherent deception, by breaking the suspension of disbelief. In a sense, every time we play, we accept to be played by rules and mechanics established by another person. If we do not fall into the trap of viewing simulations as objective and neutral reproductions of the real world, between designer and the player, there can be a transparent relationship. Being video gamed should not scare us. The designer's authorities and biases are methodically stripped down and dismantled by the act of playing and by the exploration of the system's limits and constraints. The relationship between designer and players is subtly sadomasochistic and extremely confrontational. You get mad at a video game, while when television pisses you off, you just change the channel. Television invites us to sink into the couch, while video games make us stiffen and lean towards the screen. Their roads are always uphill. Hi, welcome to the outro. Wasn't that all just terribly fascinating and interesting? Well, it was all lies. First, I want to point out that the next chapter in Whitlock's paper deals with um, the problem with character in video games compared to in theater and agency and, narr and narrative and all that stuff. It's really, really interesting, but alas, this video goes on for long enough and all over the place enough. Also, I don't feel like I did Rancier justice, but we'll get back to him in the future. Don't worry. I also need to point out that there's a lot of direct quotes back there that because of my really messy script writing process, I don't have time to cite directly, but I'll work on that and hopefully I'll be able to do that for the next video. Apologies. Because this is my second video and I'm kind of still getting my head around how to efficiently use my time, how to efficiently get deep in the right places. Looking back at the script, I'm not too happy with some of the links I do between the sections and I think I'm guilty of some of the stuff that I have been critiquing throughout this video. So hopefully in the future, I'll do a rebuttal slash follow up to this video with the academic and intellectual rigorosity that is the aim for this channel. So if that video or one on um, speed running and narrative legitimacy or one on avatar death or one on video games as a commercial versus as an act product sound appealing to you, please subscribe. Press the like button obviously and the notification thingy if you need that to know that my videos are there for you. If you can and want, please do become a Patreon and help support this channel. Um, you'll get your name in the credits and at higher tiers, you could even get a hat. And for you, those of you that don't actually Patreon, uh, don't worry, the hats don't actually affect the gameplay, it's purely cosmetic. I wanna thank my producer, Jan. Uh, I wanna thank the co-producer and set designer, uh, Buko. I want to thank Marta for helping me film all this stuff. I want to thank Mayo for all his technical know-how and like, like if this is a mess, you should have 
Anyway, um, I want to thank my family for putting up with me, my friends for being there with a pint when I need one, uh, all the staff at the various libraries and cafes where I do all the research. Um, and I want to especially thank anyone I've forgotten to. Did I thank my family? I better thank them again, just in case. I want to thank my family for putting up with me. Anyway, uh, I'll see you lovely people later. And uh, yeah, bye-bye.